Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. All the things that I do are on links listed over on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or UBU for life. All spelled out and the number four in the middle. I'd like to start with a poem from Mary Oliver in her anthology called Devotions. And the poem is called Snow Geese. Oh, to love what is lovely and will not last. What a task to ask of anything or anyone. Yet it is ours, and not by the century or the year, but by the hours. One fall day I heard about above me and above the sting of the wind, a sound I did not know, and my look shot upward. It was a flock of snow geese winging it faster than the ones we usually see and being the color of snow, catching the sun. So we were, in part at least, golden. I held my breath, as we do sometimes to stop time, when something wonderful has touched us, as with a match which is lit and bright, but does not hurt in the common way, but delightfully, as if delight were the most serious thing you ever felt. The geese flew on. I have never seen them again. Maybe I will. Someday. Somewhere. Maybe I won't. It doesn't matter. What matters is that when I see them, when I saw them, I saw them. As through the veil, secretly, joyfully, clearly. From the Act of Life by Parker J. Palmer. Throughout my thoughts from this book, our exploration of the act of life will be made by means of stories and poems. So I want to say a few more words about learning from fiction and myths. Some readers may doubt that insight into the factual word, world of action can come through fictional texts. Perhaps they will find the words of Eli Weisel as challenging as I am, as I have. Some events do take place but are not true. Others are, although they never occurred. The tales that I explore in this book sometimes defy logic and fact. But when they do, it is for the sake of truth. Truth is a complex network of relationships, and we're drawn into it through the complex patterns of stories and poems. By exploring mythical accounts of action that are truthful in ways that mere facts never can be, we gain formative images and metaphors with which to criticize and celebrate our active lives. More than that, we gain new friends. I've lived with these tales for some years, and the gifts they have given me go far beyond images and insights. They have given me companions who are sometimes more vivid than real people. Guides who can be called on at moments when I need their help. I hope that the reader will form new friendships as well as new ideas in the course of this book. The beings who inhabit these stories and poems can goad us and guide us with their living presence long after our abstract ideas about them have faded from mind. A comment by Martin Buber about the power of stories says all that I am trying to say. A story must be told in such a way that it constitutes help in itself. My grandfather was lame. Once they asked him to tell a story about his teacher, and he related how his teacher used to hop and dance while he prayed. My grandfather rose as he spoke, and he was so swept away by this story that he began to hop and dance to show how the master had done. From that hour, he was cured of his lameness. That's how to tell a story. 
I will be reflecting on two prose poems by Xuan Su, a 4th century B.C. Chinese Taoist teacher. The translations were done by Thomas Morton. And while the texts are said to be faithful to the original language, they are also filtered to, through Morton's sensibilities as a 20th century person. Merton wrote over 50 books, and when he weighed his own work toward the end of his life, The Way of Chuan Su came up as one of his clear favorites. One reason is obvious. Su is a charming, rascally character with a keen eye for human foibles and a splendid sense of humor, who delights in upsetting apple carts but does it all with a transparent love for humanity. Since that description fits Merton himself, it is easy to see why he was drawn to the Taoist sage. But there is a deeper reason for Merton's affinity, I think. Merton the Christian found insight in the apparently alien tradition of Taoism, insight that did not compete with Christianity but sometimes completed it. Perhaps some symbols and formulas of Christian theology had grown old for Merton, and he found that Xuan Tzu, the same image of imagery that the parables of Jesus must have had for their original hearers. In the kind of teaching that Jesus and Xuan Tzu did, freshness is crucial. The teaching counts on taking you by surprise, and once the images become predictable, they stop teaching altogether. That two such different characters as Xuan Tzu and Jesus coming from two different cultures, could end up teaching convergent truths in similar ways, is further evidence of the wholeness that is hidden behind the world's diversities. With this brief background, let us see what Chuan Su has to say about the life of action. If an expert does not have some problem to vex him, he is unhappy. If a philosopher's teaching is never attacked, she pines away. If critics have no one on whom to exercise their spite, they are unhappy. All such prison people are prisoners in the world of objects. He who wants followers seeks political power. He who wants rep reputation holds an office. The strong man looks for weights to lift. The brave woman looks for an emergency in which she can show bravery. The swordsman wants to battle in which he can swing his sword. People past their prime prefer a dignified retirement in which they may seem profound. People experienced in law seek dif difficult cases to extend the applications of laws. Liturgists and musicians like festivals in which they parade their ceremonial talents. The benevolent, are dutif the dutiful, are always looking for chances to display virtue. Where would the gardener be if there was no more weeds? What would become of business without a market of fools? Where would the masses be if there were no pretexts? for being jammed together and making noise? What would become of labor if there were no superfluous objects to be made? Produce, get results, make money, make friends, make changes, or you will die of despair. Those who are caught in the machinery of power take no joy except in activity and change, the whirring of the machine. Whenever an occasion for action presents itself, they are compelled to act. They cannot help themselves. They are inexplorably moved like the machine of which they are a part. Prisoners in the world of objects, they have no choice but to submit to the demands of matter. They are pressed down and crushed by external forces, fashion, the market, events, public opinion. Never in a whole lifetime do they recover their right mind. The active life. What a pity. Before you dismiss Jean Su as a total cynic about the active lives that many of us must lead, you need to know that irony is one of his chief teaching tools. 
He caricatures our activity in order to draw attention to features we'd rather overlook. Though his sketch does not do justice to all we are, it forces us to examine our action, its motives, and outcomes, with our blinders off. As his other poems make clear, Sean Su regards certain forms of the active life as vital and authentic. But here he marks, mocks a version of the active life that is all too common among us, and we need to understand his critique if we're able to come to terms with ourselves. Although this poem was written in the 4th century B.C., it references, its references and mood seem amazingly modern. No doubt that it is partly due to Merton taking license as a translator so that the poem would speak to modern men and women. But other translations I have seen have much the same contemporary tone, which suggests a more significant conclusion. The problem of action is not as modern as we think. So often we excuse our frenzy by attributing it to such 20th century ills as urbanization, technology, mass society, rapid social change, an analysis that locates the problem and therefore the solution outside ourselves. But if Xuan Tzu were protesting the pathologies of action over two millennia ago, there is no reason to believe that even a radical change in social circumstances would return us to sanity. Apparently, we have long carried the problem of action with us, and so the solutions are likely to be with us as well. From Kathleen Norris's book, The Cloister Walk. September 17th, Hildegard of Bingen. What do I, what I do not see, I do not know. Hildegard wrote to a monk late in her life. I see, hear, and know simultaneously. And learn what I know as if in a moment. But what I do not see, I do not know, for I am not learned. At, my fir at our first seminar, I tell my colleagues at the Ecumenical Institute, mostly college professors on sabbatical, this seems to me a poetic way of knowing, that poets are indeed at the mercy of what they see. In a way, I tell them, it might also describe me, a poet who has not learned. I have no advanced degrees and have never worked in academia. When my first book was published in 1971, I turned down a job in a college English department because I couldn't see myself as a teacher. I didn't know it at the time, but this was a vocational decision. I became a freelance writer instead. Some eyebrows go up. I explain that my research at the Institute will be primarily experiential and will be centered on attending the daily liturgy of the hours at the monastery. The eyebrows stay up. I talk about the way Hildegard captures in this letter the path of knowledge that I am most familiar with, in which thoughts and images constellate, converging, sometimes violently, in the subconscious. The sounds of words and the silence of images are more important at this stage than sense or meaning. In composing a poem, one often seems to move directly from ignorance to revelation, instantly from a muddled sense of things to a clear picture, with only the vaguest sense of how it happened. Experience is the ground of this way of knowing. But if visionaries and poets are at the mercy of what they see, they are also call, called to articulate it. And this requires them to employ another form of knowledge, the linear thought that enables them to communicate their experience to others. As with most human endeavors, the key to employing these complementary elements of human intelligence is balance. 
Cardinal Newman, in referring to the Benedictines as the most poetic of religious orders, has helped me to understand one aspect of their attraction for me. I've often sensed that the rhythms of monastic life, which now, as in Hildegard's time, are set to liturgical pace, foster a way of knowing that values image over idea, the synthetic over the analytical, the instantaneous over the sequential, the intuitive and the associative over the formal and prescribed. If, as Jean Leclerc has put, has put it, monastic culture is more literary than speculative. It also reflects what I mean by a poetic, poetic way of knowing. A line from Hildegard's sequence for the virgin martyr Ursula. The girl has no idea what she means. Has great resonance for me. Although it is the crowd that speaks, mocking the young woman as she is put to death. As legend has it, for being a Christian and for refusing to become the concubine of Attila the Hun, I see the mockery transfer, transformed in Hildegard's hands into a statement of defiance. Poets understand that they do not know what they mean and that this is a source of their strength. I wonder if in our modern, literal-minded age, being able to declare what I do not see, I do not know, is a mark, even a cornerstone of a poet's faith. I do not mean that we're pragmatics, like Thomas, who asked to see and touch Christ's wounds, but rather that writing teaches us to recognize that we have reached the limits of our language and our knowing and are dependent on our senses to know for us. The discipline of poetry teaches poets, at least, that they often have to say things they can't pretend to understand. In contending with words, poets come to know their power, much the way monastics do in prayer and lecto. We experience words as steeped in mystery, forces beyond our intellectual grasp, in the late 20th century, when speculative language, knowledge, and the technologies it has spawned reign supreme, poets remain dependent on a different form of knowledge, perhaps akin to what Hildegard termed seeing, hearing, and knowing simultaneously. I wonder if what made Hildegard very much a 12th century person is part of what makes poets in the 20th century seem necessary and anachronistic. I can tell that the audience is not receiving what I'm saying. Something is off. Attention I can't name. I won't know for weeks how disastrous it will be.